Welcome to Necromunda Underhive Wars, a tactical RPG set in a sprawling hive city, deep into the grim darkness of the 41st millennium. Pick a house, recruit a gang, and vie for control of the Underhive. Our first priority is to build a gang for use in several of the game's modes, starting with Operations. Operations depict the ever-sprawling war for the Underhive between the various gangs of House Escher, Goliath, and Orlok, as they fight each other and among themselves for power, control, resources, and glory. We've chosen a Goliath gang and picked our leader, a heavy melee fighter of the Brawler class. Now we need to hire some members, picking their experience level, class, starting traits, as well as name, gender, and looks. The higher their rank, the more XP they start with, and the more expensive they are to hire. They also have more past injuries and boons that they may be dealing with. These hires also gain us infamy points, as the size and legend of our gang grows. We'll discuss what you do with those in a few minutes. The individual appearance of every fighter can be completely customized, with dozens of different cosmetic options across their entire body, as well as a vast selection of color schemes. If you find a style you like, you can easily apply it across your entire gang. Whether you individualize every member of your gang to their specific personality, or you have a broad gang style, is up to you, and the possibilities are endless. Our lay mechanic started with quite a lot of banked XP, so we can make some decisions about how to level it. We've equipped him with melee weapons, and we'll take the support and tricks to class down a close combat focused path as we specialize our gang into brutal hand-to-hand -hand engagements. Every rank up gives some passive bonuses, as well as unlocking active and passive skills, which cost further XP to activate, contributing to more rank ups. After we upgrade some initial stats, we're then going to start picking skills that best fit our intended role. Active and passive skills are greatly varied and are based on rank, class, and house. They can also be upgraded up to three times to specialize further with higher stat requirements as they increase. As your fighters rank up, they may also develop talents, vices, and virtues, becoming their own character and making them unique in unexpected ways. This is on top of any injuries or death they may receive from being knocked out of action in combat. Credits can also be spent in the shop for items. Consumables, traps, grenades, armor, and of course, weapons. The Underhive Wars armory features flamethrowers, cryoguns, bolters, swords, massive axes, the list goes on. Finally, you can spend your credits on gambling caskets. Caskets are also received as rewards from matches in the Underhive or can be found in the field. To be clear, in-game credits or caskets will never be offered for real money and this is not and will not be a microtransaction system. Money is valuable in the Underhive, but not so much as blood and violence. Having purchased some gear, leveled up our gang and customized them, we're ready to begin operations. The first phase of this is picking a sector. These come in various difficulties, decided by how many enemy gangs there are and their ratings. Essentially a power level, based on their available gear, level of their gangers, and so on. Each sector also has a specific goal to complete, and its own set of rewards and tasks. Beginning an operation means choosing your facilities and spending infamy points on unique upgrades. These are gang-wide and usually focus on additional credit, XP, or loot gains. There's a massive selection, so as your infamy increases from battles and hiring, find your preferred combos for your gang. Once you're inside a sector, a mission map will appear. Here you can choose where in the sector you will go to gather resources, fight for glory, or otherwise build your gang and destroy your enemies. In this first case, our chosen target does not have any rival gangs present during this shift, so we collect the loot and go on our way, gaining a moderate amount of XP for our fighters. On the next shift, we encounter an Orlok gang, and so a fight will begin, but not in this video. We also have Skirmish Mode, where you can make multi or single player games to your specifications using our wide selection of maps and game modes. Choose enemies and their rating, determine teams, and decide whether the battle will have lasting effects or not. Fight your friends to prove who is better, or team up against the AI for a classic comp stomp. That's just one way to play Necromunda Underhive Wars. We also have a sprawling 15 mission campaign mode tracking the fates of three gangs as they dive deep on the hunt for ancient secrets. The following gameplay is taken from mission 6 of the campaign, 
featuring the Escher gang, the Bane Cats, led by the brutal and intelligent Tessera. The battle begins with our first female fighters deployed out of the way on a gantry overlooking an ongoing battle. The Orlok and Goliath gangs were here to take this encampment from, the Chokers and Dog Soldiers respectively, are already duking out below and haven't had the time to look up and see us bearing down on them. Assuming we can stop running into these corrosive mines, our elevated position is extremely valuable. Damage and resistance bonuses apply to any combat against foes that are below you. There are also specific sets of skills that can be only used from up high. Take whatever we can use. And the medical supply. We're a long way from all. However, our close range specialist flamer and cryo wielders can deal with enemies that find themselves approaching our level. Tessera, the gang leader and crack shot, can start to snipe off enemies wounded by her sisters. Aimed shots, such as this, allow for specific targeting of body parts. Choose ones with less armor or that are more exposed from cover. One of the special conditions of this mission is that Goliath reinforcements are constantly arriving through this door. We have to get to it and shut it down as one of our objectives, preferably before we're overwhelmed. This Orlok, having survived our assault, goes for his revenge, but it won't last long. He's spending a lot of AP on one devastating attack rather than spreading his damage. Probably the best bet in this scenario, since he's likely dead either way. That's him dealt with on our turn, meaning the platform is now ours. One of our other targets, the Orlok leader Zekken, is trying to retake the platform. We'll have to deal with him and use our heavy to move around the battlefield and shoot him in the head. A good solution to most problems in the Underheart. The advantage gained, we can turn the tables on him from the platform. Zekken will be taken out by our final gang member with some long range shots. Kira is in a good position to make a dash for the door on our next turn. We can then escape back up to the elevator and heal with a special ability. With further incursions onto the upper levels, it's time to show the Orlocks why you should never let an Escher, particularly to Sarah, close. Swapping weapons in combat is easy and costs minimal AP, making it a key strategy if your fighters are built in a way to take advantage of it. Supporting melee fighters with ranged allies, just like this, is also key. As the fight continues, Kira is in a great spot to toss grenades into the scramble below her. With the Orlok leader dead and the Goliath spewing door locked, cleaning up stragglers is the name of the game. With a more mobile force already on the high ground, the Orlocks and Goliaths are easy picking. This was just a taste of everything Necromunda Underhive Wars has to offer when it releases on September 8th. Another 14 missions, infinitely more ways to design and build your own gang, and much more.